Guten Morgen. That's the extent of my German. <laughs> um, and maybe I'll be doing it at the end. Um, all right, so my name is Karim Yagmar. And um, in the next 50 or so minutes, what I'll try to do is um, convey what I've been able to find about Brillo and Weave. Um, and do so in a very specific fashion, which is using the sources that they've released. Um, as somebody asked me right before the presentation here is, um, how come you can actually talk about this since all of their stuff about Brillo and Weave is still confidential? Um, if you're part of the beta and you visited their website, you know that essentially they've got this, you know, please replicate this anywhere. And it's like written in big red letters at the top. Um, I haven't used any of that material at all. In fact, I deliberately shot away from it. So what I'm using really is the sources that they've released, which are um, on android.googlesource.com. All right, before I get started here, I just want to make sure I have a good feeling of who's in the room. So if you could just raise your hand for the following questions. Who's got any sort of Android platform development experience? Okay, a Linux kernel development experience. All right, who signed up on the Brillo beta? Okay, handful. All right. Um, yeah, that's good enough for me. All right, so, um, yeah, computer. Um, yeah, the slides I'll, will be up after the presentation. I'm the kind of guy that finishes his uh, slides 15 minutes before, wink, wink. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> um, just a bit of background about myself, if you've never, never heard about me. I wrote the Embedded Linux book for O'Reilly about 13, 15 years ago. Um, it's rumored to have been used to put Linux on the first Amazon Kindle, so that is something that's really cool. Um, a couple of years back, I wrote the embedded Android book for O'Reilly, uh, which has also been used uh, for quite a variety of different cool products, unfortunately, most of which I can't tell you about. Uh, <laughs> um, I've been involved in open source for about 20 some years, uh, most widely known uh, for having written the Linux Trace Toolkit, which was one of the first tracing tools for the Linux kernel. Uh, fortunately, somebody else has been um, doing a much better job at maintaining it since 2005 than I was. Um, and they're actually here uh, doing some talks as well. Um, and I used to be heavily involved with um, Project ERA, um, which, as you probably know, um, has somewhat bit, uh, been put on the ice. Um, and that's pretty much it. The thing I want to highlight here is that despite my background and you know any books I might have written, I don't actually know everything. Um, it is very likely that people in the room here might know more about some things than I do. And if, if that is the case, please feel free to uh, go ahead and uh, share whatever your experience is. In fact, I'm fairly easygoing about these presentations. The more questions get asked during the talk, the more entertaining it is. So um, otherwise, I hope you're well caffeinated because this might be very boring. <laughs> Okay, just a bit of, um, of background here. I mean, what gets me interested in Brillo and Weave? Um, and, and you'll see it's a bit different. I mean, my view of Brillo and Weave is different than what, say, Google might be pitching about it, although I think they have a nice pitch. Uh, there are some things that I think are intrinsically interesting about Brillo and Weave beyond what Google wants to do with them necessarily. Um, so first of all, let me just, sorry? Oh, I thought somebody had a question. All right, um, let me just give a bit of history here about what gets us um, into, you know, Brillo or Weave and, you know, whatever. Why is that interesting? Um, first of all, what is embedded Linux? So, you know, um, I would like to think that having written a 400-page book on the topic, I would know something about it. <laughs> um, unfortunately, embedded Linux is not something that you can actually define very precisely. Uh, the best I can come up with is... Um, uh, embedded Linux being, say, an, a set of ad hoc recipes for creating customized uh, Linux root file systems running on top of the Linux kernel for specific purposes. Um, beyond that, really, uh, there's no strict definition of what embedded Linux is. It's a very broad term. Um, usually, however, when you are talking about embedded Linux, there are some usual suspects. There's uh, BusyBox. You probably have U-Boot in there. Obviously, yeah, likely you have the Linux kernel and a few other things such as that. Um, but um, there is no formal definition of it. And beyond that, the one thing that's um, still to this day, to a certain extent, an irritant with embedded Linux is that whenever you create an embedded Linux system, you are defining the API of what that system is. All right? um, you have to spec it out, and you have to find people that will know how to code for that thing. 
uh, whatever those APIs and libraries that you choose from, all right? Um, so that's something that, um, that is a challenge. Um, and another thing that's, that's, that had historically been a challenge is user interfaces. There's not been kind of like a standard user interface for, for embedded Linux other than, say, Android when that came along, all right? Now, Android, interestingly, is a very custom use of Linux uh, in an embedded setting, um, that being predominantly, obviously, in, uh, mobile in the beginning, um, gradually um, other things than mobile, um, including, you know, obviously, um, things like cars um, and um, uh, other interesting niche um, applications with time. Some things Android um, kind of rewrote from scratch. Um, and in the beginning, that used to rub me the wrong way. So for example, you know, when I got into Android, I was like, oh, well, look, probably it's going to be, you know, got, got BusyBox or whatever else. And then you get in there, and it's got this thing, bastard thing called Toolbox. And in the beginning, for those of you who've used it, it used to really suck very bad. Um, they, they've made it better over time, and now they outright replaced it with something called Toybox. But you know, that's the pattern they've applied throughout the stack. They've gone out of their way to replace key things that were licensed, that were originally licensed under GPL or LGPL with things that were either BSD or Apache licensed. In fact, if you go back to uh, some of the very early presentations they've done about um, Android at Google I.O., so I think about 2008, they had a presentation called The Anatomy of an Android, and the gentleman in the talk essentially um, outright uh, says it that you know they deliberately chose to replace um, things that they felt did not have the proper licenses. All right. So if you're coming from an embedded Linux background and you get into Android, one of the first things that kind of surprises a bit is is uh, the extent to which they've replaced things that are common um, in, in embedded Linux. Um, the difference between embedded Linux and Android is embedded Linux was an organic thing. You know, nobody set out um, day one uh, saying we're going to create embedded Linux. It's more like, you know, some people were using DOS, embedded DOS in the mid-90s in their embedded systems, and they started looking at this Linux thing for their desktops, and eventually they're like, wait a second, this thing runs on an x86, why can't I just run this on my embedded system? And you know, people start piecing things together. Um, at a certain point, you need a bootloader, somebody to write to boot, you need a C library, there are UC, Linux, UC libc, and so on and so forth. Um, Android, on the other hand, was a very deliberate effort on the part of a single corporation to create um, a embedded Linux distribution uh, with a very specific purpose in mind. And what they've been able to accomplish with that is something that we've never had with Linux, which is, uh, or embedded Linux, is a standard API that is known by a lot of people, all right? Uh, we can, you know, complain a lot about many things in Android, but one thing they got right is an API um, that is standard across all devices. Um, what else can I say about this? So yeah, they've introduced a few different things, you know, fast boot and so on and so forth. All right, um, this I just picked up off of uh, Google Plus. Um, you can see that essentially, in terms of market share, Android has eaten everything. Uh, one of the people that responded back to my post on Google Plus was saying, was like, oh, no wonder Google, um, sorry, Apple is trying to go after cars because they've exhausted their ramp up on the, <laughs> the phone side of things. You know, that's, that's it, it's done. Um, and this is, this is very impressive because, you know, we've been talking about, you know, Linux coming, say, to the desktop for the past 20 or so years, and it never has and it probably never will because the growth vector for desktops has flattened. But in terms of mobile, it has definitely eaten everything out, all right? Um, and this is interesting because from the embedded perspective, there's a lot uh, to be said about using a standard platform that is widely deployed to users for embedded purposes, right? Um, such, was, such was the case with DOS, um, and such did, you know, at least Microsoft try to push it with uh, Windows NT, and uh, famously Mark Andreessen had said that uh, running, window, uh, running Windows on your pacemaker was a self-replicating market. Um, <laughs> um, so, um, but Android today essentially being deployed on so many devices makes it an interesting starting point for embedded uses. And so along the way, uh, say in 2012, 
um, I, 11, I had a customer approach me and say, hey, we'd like to run Android on headless systems. And at first, I kind of giggled. I said, hey, you got to be kidding me. Why? Just use Linux. I mean, if you don't want the UI, just go ahead and grab that thing that's called Linux, which is what's underneath Android anyway. Um, and they made two uh, important points. The first one was um, the fact that they had multiple devices, multiple product lines, um, some of which had user interfaces, some of which did not. And they did not want to have to maintain, you know, multiple operating systems. And I thought that made sense. I mean, that makes that is that from a business perspective, that is a valid point, right? You don't want to maintain separate separate stacks altogether. The other point they made was that if they were using Android, they can get any Joe app developer to code for their embedded system, right? And that's that is that is a lot of uh, that is a lot of value, right? Because you don't have to find somebody that has specific, you know, knowledge on an embedded. They they just have to know how to write apps. So um, uh, at ELC, I believe 2012, um, I had done a presentation about how, how to take Android and essentially strip the, uh, the user interface off of it and run it um, straight on, on uh, whatever device that you got. Um, and, and when I presented that back then, it, people laughed it off. It's like, you gotta be kidding, Kareem. Nobody wants to do this. Um, and interestingly enough, I was asked to do the same presentation six months later at Lenaro Connect Copenhagen and then as I was presenting, somebody raised his hand and asked, hey, have you let, check, checked out the ro.config.headless flag? I'm like, I don't know, what is that? What is, when did this appear? And so in the interim between my presentation and that uh, other conference, um, Google had put out uh, the Nexus uh, Q, which was this uh, media box. Um, and in the release that came out, the Android release that came out with that, they had a flag that actually turned the, the thing headless. Um, and that was kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if there was any causality there, but it was kind of uh, funny that they, they were interested in that. Which gets me to Brillo. So Brillo is actually a deliberate effort on the part of Google uh, to actually take the success of Android and actually turn it into you know, um, an embedded Linux distribution. Obviously, the goal they have um, is the Internet of Things thing. <laughs> which is let's put this everywhere and let's collect data and let's facilitate data collection and uh, device enablement and all this cloud stuff, all right? Um, I'm coming to this from the, the other perspective, which is I don't care about your cloud thing, but hey, you've got this operating system that's based on Android, leverages a lot of things from Android and runs on my embedded system. That, that's something I like. Um, and I wanna you know, cherry pick what's, what's of interest to me, all right? Um, so, um, it was announced at I.O. Um, <clears throat> 2015, and as I was attending the keynote, I was like, whoa, whoa wait a second, <laughs> picture, 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 what's the, what are those diagrams? And they had references to how and stuff like that. And, but they hadn't released any code yet. Uh, later that year, about um, in the fall or something like that, they made the first code drop. Whoever played with that, uh, the code drop they made uh, at the fall 2015? Okay, well, I guess I'm the only one. Anyway, so I grabbed this piece of code and I started digging into it. It's like, okay, what is this? I mean, what are they trying to do here? How does this work? How is this different from Android? Um, and it, what I discovered is that, at least at that, you know, that snapshot in time, my feeling was that Brillo was this bastard child of Android and Chrome OS. Uh, because <laughs> it was using <laughs> a lot of things from Android, but it was mostly built with Gen 2 things as well. So, and it was based on Dbus. Most of the communication was Dbus based uh, among all the pieces of the system. Uh, nowadays, they've actually moved away from that. So today, they actually uh, are using uh, Binder, as I'll show you a bit later. Uh, a lot of the thing, the, the the glue in there is uh, is based on Binder. And and kind of like as I was saying, you know the um, the talk is based on the analysis of the sources. So I don't know what they say in their documentation online when you register, uh, when you're on uh, the beta, uh, but you know, everything that I've got here, I've essentially deduced from looking at the, at the sources. So what's interesting is that you can actually get the sources off of essentially uh, android.googlesource.com, which is the same location where they're host, hosting the AOSP. Um, AOSP being the Android Open Source Project, for those of you who might not be familiar with the term. Um, and most of the directories or the Git repositories um, that they need for Brillo are common to um, Android as well. So it's kind of like, you know, they're pointing, they're, they have two manifest files pointing to similar directories, except one of the manifest files has a lot fewer entries, as I'll show you, um, and some, a handful of additions that are 
you know, custom to Brillo, which are not found uh, inside of Android. All right, let's talk about um, architecture a bit. So, um, okay, the color coding in my diagrams is gray stuff is in C, yellow stuff is in um, Java, but has to do with the system, and then orange is regular applications, which you can't see on this diagram because they aren't there yet. I'll show you, the, uh, I'll show you that to you in a second. Uh, an embedded Linux system, uh, again, per my earlier description, is fairly generic. Um, so Linux kernel, C library, probably a busy box, and some custom application, all right? There's nothing much more to say about that. Um, if you're using Yocto or Buildroot or whatever else, you probably have also some usual suspects that go with that, will depend on whatever packaging system you're using. If you look at the architecture of Android, um, this is a bit what it looks like. Um, so at the bottom most, you've got the Linux kernel, much like an embedded Linux system. But everything above that is custom, all right? So when you go to the um, native user space right here, you've got your Bionic, which is the C library. You've got the hardware abstraction layer, which is one of the key features of um, the architecture of Android. You've got some native daemons. You've got um, a user space shell, which is toy box. And then you've got the system services, which are the core of the operating system. And at the very top, you've got applications. Um, and this stack, which is about seven or eight layers deep and is fairly hairy to deal with, um, is yet being deployed on hundreds of millions of devices. So this, there's, it's a known quantity to a certain extent, all right, despite the challenges that go with this. And the idea is, if I want to take this and build a custom Linux distribution with it, um, that is, say, for a more general purpose than uh, running user applications, what can I do with that? And that's, you know, really what Brillo is about. So um, moving a bit more, into the stack, um, this is the binder functionality. Who's ever investigated binder to a certain extent? A few people? All right, yeah, uh, ish, <laughs> okay. Um, okay, binder is an IPC mechanism. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, just wanna make sure I, uh, everybody understands it a bit because it is fundamental to Android and these days it is also fundamental to, uh, to Brillo. So um, think of sockets, but you know, minus network connectivity and minus essentially the large file descriptors associated with those things in the kernel space. It's a very lightweight, so to speak, uh, communication mechanism. Um, and the idea there is you got, um, you're serializing parameters and return a function called return values between two parties. So if I want to talk to a service, I'm going to call function foobar. Uh, function foobar has an ID and I'm gonna find that service's identifier. I'm gonna say I'm talking to function ID and here are the parameters of the function. It's gonna call that thing on my behalf, return me the return value, and off I go. A binder driver doesn't need any hardware, so when it starts, it just initializes itself and then stays dormant. The first thing that talks to this thing is called the service manager, which is on the left-hand side there. Um, it is kind of like a DNS service. You give it a string, it gives you a binder ID, and you use that binder ID to talk to the service that you're designating, all right? And just to illustrate this a bit more, because we found this, when we've worked with customers in the past, we found it's really challenging for people to grasp what this thing is about. So let me just uh, give you a demo here of um, a piece of software that we wrote that allows you to better visualize what's going on here. So uh, what did I build this for? I think I built this for uh, uh, six, all right. Let's go with that. Uh, really? Okay. Uh, out. Try it. Product generic. Previous build. What did I build for? And that's what I thought. So let's go with this. Five. Sorry. Okay, much better. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna let this guy restart. Um, let's do that. Uh, sure, why not do that? And now he's gonna die or not. ADB shell, does that work? It does, all right. 
So we got this tool that we put on GitHub called Binder Explorer, and it allows you to essentially just grab what is working on what is whatever state Binder has and display it to you. So uh, that, this uh, files, something else. This, node. So we try to be trendy and we're using Node.js. <laughs> All right, start this. Let's go with localhost. All right. Just give it a second. Uh, and in fact, it should do a much better job than this. Let me just try one thing. Let's try that. Try this. He's going to complain, and that's okay. Now, oh, he's trying to get the icons. Let me reload. Okay, so what you're seeing on the periphery are the system services, or in other words, the Android operating system. And what you're seeing in the middle is the applications, uh, or some binaries that are running in the system. And the um, um, links that you see there are the binder communications. All right, so as you can see, the binder bus, so to speak, even though they don't call it that way, is fairly busy, all right? Um, and what we can do here is, uh, say for example, I can go check out, um, what is this, the phone application. So what is the, well, no, actually that's the dialer, sorry. What is the dialer talking to, right? Um, and you can see the system services that it's talking to, and on the other side, you can highlight any of the system services, and on the other side, see which apps are talking to that, all right? So it's a kind of, a, at a glance view of what Binder does. Brillo uses Binder, and what I'll show you in a few minutes is the snap, same snapshot, but for what's going on with Brillo, all right? So let me go back to my slides up here somewhere. All right, so that's for um, Binder. Now, um, as you can see in my diagram, there is a lot of system services. If you want to find out what system services you have, you can just go in the shell. Uh, I'm gonna have to kill this, I'm sorry. Uh, all right, so let's do this. Service list, for those of you not familiar with it, I've got 100 system services. They keep adding a handful every so often, all right? Um, the system services are housed in different processes. There is a main system underscore server process that houses the bulk of the Java system services. Um, and then you've got C system services, uh, which are housed in separate processes. Um, they seem to do a um, deliberate effort to put anything that is um, sensitive to human interaction into a C process instead of a Java system service. Um, so anything that has to do with, um, you know, sensors or graphics or audio or multimedia seems to be deliberately put in C because of lag, right? They don't want the garbage collector to come in and, you know, stop your video as you're kind of like trying to listen to something on YouTube. All right, the other distinctive thing about Android is the hardware abstraction layer. So Android system services, which are kind of like the core of the operating system, don't know much about slash dev. In fact, they deliberately don't know anything about slash dev. Instead of that, they know something about HAL definitions, which are the APIs that the um, various system services uh, need to actually talk to hardware. And insofar as the system service finds, say, the lights HAL, it thinks it can talk to lights. How, you know, however the HAL layer does its thing, it just looks for the, um, the HAL uh, SO file, and that's it. In Android, the HALs are far away from applications. They are inside system services processes, which are privileged, um, whereas apps can't actually talk to any of the hardware directly. They have to remotely call through Binder to the system service to actually access the hardware. In Brillo, this is kind of turned on its head, and your application that you write opens the HAL module and talks to it directly. Um, that's really one of the benefits of Brillo is that they're reusing or leveraging the existing um, code base of HALs that are out there, uh, or the fact that SOC vendors know how to write HALs to actually uh, allow people to um, code apps that use those HALs directly. So this is Dbus. Um, again, you know, um, as I mentioned, historically, Brillo was mostly based on uh, Dbus. 
And for those of you not familiar with the, and this is something I grabbed from Dbus's documentation. So Dbus works by having a daemon that's running in the background. And whenever you've got two parties that want to talk to each other, they go through that daemon to actually get the message across. And in fact, if you followed the whole discussion about uh, KD bus and all that kind of stuff, the idea was to re repatriate some of that stuff into the kernel to kind of like, um, you know, uh, make it more efficient. So this is what Brillo is. We're just really getting rid of the entire stack above um, the native layer, all right? Um, anybody remember, um, what was it called again? Um, Tiny Android from the 2.x days. So uh, in the 2.x branch, you could actually build the AOSP and say, I want to build Tiny Android. And what that was really was just the bare bones file system with a few of the pieces in the native layer, and that was it. And so Brillo is kind of like similar to that to a certain extent. Um, it is really just a bare bones uh, Android. Uh, but the interesting thing here is they've got the HAL in there that you can use to actually um, code IoT applications. Okay. Weave, on the other hand, and that's one thing. So, you know, coming to Brillo Weave from an Android background myself, one of the things that confused me is all their discussion about Brillo and Weave. And I was like, what the heck's this and what the heck is that? Um, so, Brillo is the distribution, all right? It's that thing that you compile into an image and run on your device. Weave is a bunch of daemons that run on that along with some cloud services, all right? And the idea is that um, there's a weave daemon running on the device that listens for requests coming in from either a um, handset or a tablet or whatever directly, or comes from the cloud and possibly is triggered also by the phone or mobile device or whatever else. Um, you don't have to use weave. Right? Um, you can just go with Brillo and ignore Weave completely. You, you don't have to run this daemon, in fact, at all. So let me give you the lay of the land. Let's go looking at the sources, see what is around, and how is it different from, from Android. First of all, um, as I said, if you want to get, grab the sources, they are on android.googlesource.com. And if you do a repo in it, with the Brillo manifest, notice it says here, you know, Brillo, not uh, Android. Uh, my highlighting is not working. You do repo sync, you get yourself Androids, I'm sorry, Brillo sources, right? It's just a different manifest file. In fact, if I go to out to um, here, android.googlesource.com, come on, what's he connected to? No, that's not going to work. Hey, where's my, sorry. I've got a hotspot, but he seems to ignore my hotspot. All right, I'll just reboot this thing and come back to it in a second. All right, let me go back to the slides. So um, I'll show you the manifest file uh, in a minute or two here. Okay. Now, if you look at the top level of the sources that you get, so let me actually go here. Let's change the color coding a bit. No, not this. All right, let's go to here. Brillo master. Okay. So this is my top level of the Brillo sources. Um, if you're familiar with the AOSP, you'll recognize most of the directories, all right? But you should also realize that some things are gone, and I'll, I'll tell you what, what's gone in, in a minute here, and we'll walk through some of the things that are in this tree. You'll notice that it has same kind of basic functionality. You've got a top-level make file, which has almost nothing. Um, you do the regular, you know, build, sorry, Build, ENV, set up SH, launch, that's regular stuff for Android. Brillo uses the same kind of build system. Whether you despised it or not, you will continue despising it here. Uh, um, so that's for the build system, and it also has an out directory like you know Android does. 
All right, and this layout underneath out is practically the same thing. Out, you know, target product in this case is uh, Brillo emulator, whatever else, and whatever I have under here, underneath here. Um, so what do we got um, in here? So Bionic is the C library, same thing. Bootable is the OTA stuff, still here. Build is the build system, st still here. Device is essentially the, repo the rep well, not the repos directory where you've got the actual BSPs, all right? And you can see the manufacturer names in there. So you've got uh, the Intel boards in here. You've got the uh, Qualcomm-based boards in here and all the other ones um, that uh, they've supported in, um, in Brillo. And the same way it used to work before. So if you look in here, you've got the Minnow board, for example. And this is the information about the Minnow board, um, or the BSP for the Minnow board. And if you go in the QCOM stuff, you've got the Dragon board um, stuff in here as well. Right, and this really is where Brillo shines, which is those SOC vendors, you know, given the market share that we saw earlier, are already doing a lot of work to get Android working on their devices, <clears throat> and by so doing, they're also enabling Brillo. So that's really the genius of this Brillo thing. My, my suspicion is that they, um, okay, so if you looked at the very early releases of Brillo, it, again, you know, I said, you know, I call, I kind of, uh, Mockley called it the bastard child of Chrome, Chrome and, uh, and Android. But interestingly, it, seem, it seems that it is an effort that stemmed from the Chrome folks. And my suspicion, and I have really no substantiation for this, is they, they started off with, with Chrome and then somebody told them, you know, hey, why don't you check this Android thing? You've got this huge device enablement uh, from the silicon vendors. Well, let's, let's go with that instead. Um, and, and so that's where, you know, um, it seems to have um, merged into this, uh, morphed into this Brillo thing. Um, in external, interestingly, there's a lot more, there's a lot less stuff than Android. In fact, I've got a slide here um, from, of what is gone from external. If, if, it, if it was used for any Java purpose, was a library for the purposes of Java, or um, had anything to do with Java, it's just out the window, all right? Um, and you can see there's a ton of stuff that's completely gone from here. Um, in fact, you know, you can do a very stupid, you know, okay, what's the size of this guy versus the size of, say, one of my AOSP trees. Let me go out here into, I don't know, um, 50, which I got. <coughs> Sorry. So that's 2.6 gigs here and it's 2 gigs here. Oh, actually, not that big of a difference in terms of size. I'm a bit surprised, although there's a lot of stuff that's gone. Um, that's gone out. Oh, that's what it is. Um, so I'll go back to the top level removals in a second. Um, so that's external frameworks, which is essentially the core of the Android uh, operating system, noticeably doesn't have a framework space. Okay? Framework space is the uh, most important piece in terms of uh, Java. This is where the um, Android app developer APIs are found, and that's where the Java system services are found, and it's just not here in Brillo, all right? That's just because of they vacating all of the Java stuff. Um, if you go to, if you sign up for the um, Brillo uh, beta, you'll see that some people have actually inquired on the mailing list about um, Java support. Um, so you can check those threads up. Um, that's frameworks. Okay, hardware is the same thing as before, which is the HAL, all right? Um, so uh, if I go to, and, and again, this is one of the benefits of going with this Brillo thing because they're leveraging the HALs from the, um, from Android include hardware, and the HALs are, the HAL definitions are all there as they were uh, before. Uh, what else do we got? Um, okay, let's forget about litany of helpers, the JNI thing, which I'm not sure why they kept it in there, but anyway, pre is the same thing. Products, though, is new. Okay, this, was, this is not there in Android, all right? And uh, product is essentially the directory that contains uh, whatever <coughs> product that you're trying to create, or in other words, what's your Brillo application, all right? And they have some samples here. For example, they have an example LED flasher that I'll walk you through um, in a few minutes. Okay, um, what else do we got here? Uh, 
system is the same thing as before, except they now have a few interesting things like weave D and web serve D, right? Which will, um, I'll show you a diagram of what this does in a minute. Um, but those are, those are specifically for, for Brello. Um, and then tools is another of the Android directories. So what they get rid of from the top level, so art is gone. Art is the Java virtual machine, right? CTS is gone. That's compatibility, compatibility test suite. Um, Dalvik, which also is the same, I'm sorry, typo. Developers, development docs, all this development stuff, framework space I told you about. Um, NDK is gone. Packages, which is all the default applications like the home, the launcher, and I'm sorry, the home launcher, calculator, browser, and so on. SDK, there's no SDK in here, um, and so on and so forth. Right? You can probably get some of the stuff back in, right? Depending on what it is that you're looking for. Um, I would presume that bringing the Java back in is prob probably fairly heavy, but otherwise, the rest of the stuff should be. Um, um, I mean, if it's C-based, if it's a C library or whatever, you probably can get it back in fairly easily. Um, some stuff they've added to external. So uh, interestingly, you see there's Gen 2. <laughs> uh, because in fact, if you, go to the, uh, if you go through the sources, you'll find a lot of G GYP uh, files, at least in the older release, they used to have a lot of them. I, I can't remember, I don't know, I, I didn't find dot dash name, star GYP, how about that? Mm. That's still a bit of it, but I, I remember distinctly that in the, in the older release, they had a lot more uh, GYP files around. Okay, in terms of images, what does it look like? What does it generate? Um, so you can see, okay, it's not a it's not a one to one comparison. I'm like using a 32 bit target versus a 64 bit one, but you still see that. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, the system image is like a tenth of its original size, even though this is a 64 bit uh, platform that I'm measuring it against. Um, there is no. Uh, RAM disk because they've merged essentially the RAM disk and the system image in a single um, partition. Um, the user data part uh, image is a bit uh, misleading because this is actually um, on my 64-bit Brillo here. I've actually added some stuff um, <coughs> that is not in the original. And this is kind of like comparing the Android user space versus the Brillo user space. So uh, forget about cache, forget about the SD storage. In the system partition, you don't have app, funds, or framework. You don't have Java, so there's no need for framework. Um, and you can see that I'm boxing out the system and RAMDIS together because they are actually a single image with both of these things on them. Um, data partition is still, still the same as before. All right. And if I run this thing, which is my intent, uh, let's do this. Uh, lunch, and I was running number 10. Let's do that. Uh, no, 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 that's not the name of it. This is the name of it. Rillo emulator. And let's not run it in ampersand. Uh, yes, okay, fine. He doesn't like the fact that I've got this guy running in the background. Out you go. Awesome. So it starts off essentially like on the shell uh, right here. There's no you know, QEMU window that opens up because there's nothing to be shown. But I do get a shell here. Uh, and I can also use the ADB shelling capabilities that I used to have before. So um, actually, now let's do this. Lunch. No, 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 wrong one, sorry, wrong tree. Let's go back to this guy. Lunch 10. All right, ADB devices. So for some reason, he's got two emulators, one of, when, one of which is, is offline, but let me do this. Let's do, actually, let me see. Am I connected back to my hotspot? No, okay, cool, there we go. Um, ADB-S emulator 5554 shell. All right. So I've got here essentially, this one is XTD6 based. Uh, no, that's not what I wanted, CPU info. So um, this is just you know, XTD6 on, on XTD6 in this case. Um, if you look at the top level of the tree, there's a lot of things that look alike. 
you know, ACCT, you've got the init environment, um, you've got uh, the system partition. A lot of the uh, basics of the, uh, the file system are the same. Most noticeably, as I mentioned, if you go underneath system, there is no framework, all right? You've got many of, much of the same functionality, so get prop, you know, still uh, global properties from Android, they're still here. You want to look at the list of uh, processes. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff that comes back. Service manager, um, they've got you know media server and so on. And I'll show you in a second here um, what the difference is in terms of graphs between Brillo and uh, and Android. Um, obviously, you've got Web Weave D and Web Serve D, which are the uh, Weave specific things which are, are being run on on this device. So let me go show you um, data, sorry, local TMP. Let me show you the difference of graphs between those two things. Let's go here, node, app, this. Uh, and now let's open another window. That, launch this, ADB forward. Oh, sure, yeah, why not? Dash S. Okay. Go back to this guy. Let's go to localhost. 3000. Great. Is he running? Oh, yes. Um, they don't mount the bugfs by default. Debug FS non sys kernel debug. So we're using for the um, that binary explorer thing. We're using uh, we're reading debug FS to get the information that that we're displaying to you. And. Nope, the other window. Hello. Computer. Well, he does have more stuff than this. Let me try again, sorry. Yeah, where are you? Well, worst comes to worst, I'll just show you a screenshot, but this does work. Um, okay, let me scrub, let me grab the screenshot from, let me see, just give me one second here. Um, that. Uh, there we go, all right. So let's do that. All right, it should look like something like that. I'm sorry, the, for some reason my display here is not working. But you, you see that essentially you've got a lot more, a lot less stuff, all right, and less things, a lot less things running. What you, uh, what is interesting though is that um, you can see that uh, Web Serve D um, is actually, and we can't see it here, but this would be Weave, uh, the Weave daemon. So essentially, they're using now um, Binder instead of Dbus to have the various Brillo, uh, Weave components talking to each other. And what this looks like in terms of, um, say, diagram if you want, is something like this. So the connections coming in from the cloud are going to Web Serve D, which essentially just is a um, basic web server, all right? And Weave D registers with um, the Web Serve D to tell it, hey, if you've got queries for these uh, URLs, or in other words, you know, there's essentially REST queries. Um, you know, um, it says, okay, I can handle that, 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 and then when the queries come in for those those um, those uh, URLs, essentially they get handed off to Weave D, which then hands off the query to LibWeave, which actually is the meat of the protocol, and then we li uh, LibWeave parses it out and essentially hands it off to whoever's uh, is registered, and then the applications or who's re who registered to actually get those queries will use the how to actually talk to the hardware. And let me show you 
um, an example of that. <clears throat> How much time we got? Oh, we're almost done. All right, let me hurry up here. Um, let me go back to my shell. So if I go under product, Google example LED flasher. So there's an LED flasher uh, service. Oh, in fact, let me, before I do that, in common, AIDL, Brillo, examples, LED flasher. There's an AIDL file. Who knows what an AIDL file is? So AIDL is an Android interface definition language file, which essentially specifies communication between a two binder parties, all right, a client and a service. And this is essentially the um, service, the API that the service will provide. Um, if you look at the service itself, um, over here, in its main function, all right, it'll essentially initialize itself, which we'll call this part here. Um, and this essentially registers the service with a name uh, over to the um, uh, 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 wrapper. And on the other side, um, the LED flasher itself, I believe, was it the service? I can't remember which one of these guys. Oh, service, actually status. This guy does an HW get module, all right? Anybody know what that is? That's a call to the HAL layer, all right? We're actually asking the HAL layer, get me that lights HAL module, all right? And if you kind of follow the code, I don't want to kind of lose everybody here just by walking through some code, but the idea here is I wanted to show you, we're talking to the HAL, we got a service talking to the other side over to the weave daemon, and essentially when it gets the request, it'll go, it's just essentially gonna call into the HAL layer straight out, right? There's no, there's no call to a system service to go to the HAL. It's, it's straight into the, in the application, in this case, the, this lights flasher. And if I go out all the way to the top underneath external, and I go for uh, libwe, which as I said is the parsing thing that actually takes care of demangling all those arrest queries. If I go to, I think examples, uh, was that it? Provider, no, daemon. There we go, I think, readme here. So in the readme here, they actually have kind of like a, um, a, uh, a how to get OAuth tickets and essentially send the queries and you can see essentially your device you know, getting, there's a console for this, there's a Weave developer console, there's an app, and essentially you can register your device with the console and have the app actually talk to it, and then you can see the queries coming in from the Weave protocol. All right. that, that's the whole benefit of this, of this Weave thing, is essentially you've got this um, cloud service that Google houses to actually um, send queries to the devices that are registered. Um, and so when I had taken a look at that, um, at least, you know, kind of like my 30,000 foot view of it was that it probably wasn't too hard to replicate what they were providing on the server side um, because the protocol is actually not that, you know, complicated, at least, you know, again, you know, uh, from an initial uh, analysis. And interestingly, somebody actually did implement a Node.js based um, Weave server. Um, so if you don't, um, presumably, and I haven't tested it myself, so I can't you know, tell you whether it's, it's good or bad, but there, there is um, code out there that if you wanted to implement your own Weave service instead of having you know, Google provide it for you, you can probably start from that code if you want to take a look at it. I think it's called, uh, and I'm going to get this wrong, or Weave 8 or something like that, um, uh, which is the kind of like the, the re-implementation of this. Um, what else did I want to tell you about this before I sign off here? So I showed you the PS list. I showed you that much of the stuff in here. Um, what else do I want to point you to? Um, yeah, so, okay. One thing I'm not doing here is actually showing you the um, site that they provide f as part of the beta to uh, people that are part of the Brillo beta. Um, you can sign up for that if you want to, and they they take a different perspective on things. As I said from the beginning here, you know I'm looking at this from a very specific um, point of view, which is can I leverage this as a stripped down embedded Linux based on Android? And yes, I can, right? Um, but they they're taking a, a different perspective, which is helping you create IoT devices with this. And so they have references on how to do that. They have boards uh, described on their website and stuff like that. And you know you're you're free to sign up and, and get access to that and look at what their the material they have for you there. Um, and so you know from my perspective, um, you know having been doing a lot of Android work, I 
like the approach they've taken with this. I hope they, they actually have some success because it gives me an alternative to uh, Yocto and, and Buildroot. Um, I, I, I have nothing to say bad about either of these projects. Um, it's just that I think that uh, in terms of device enablement, um, you know, Android's got that pretty well nailed down with most of the SOC vendors and being able to leverage that, you know, off the bat for an embedded Linux distro is, is pretty cool. Um, obviously, you know, um, it is yet not released, okay? So what happens with it for real afterwards is TBD. I have no idea. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's interesting to see that they've been able to, as I said, you know, reuse Android pretty much as is. And this is the bit I wanted to show you earlier, and I could not, so let me try to see if I'm connected now. Uh, great, my hotspot went away again. Okay, whatever, sorry, bad hotspot. <laughs> um, if you just go to androidgooglesource.com, you should be able to see that essentially they've got, um, instead of platform manifest, they have Brillo manifest. Um, that's really what I wanted to show you here. Um, and then you, you grab that manifest and you can start playing with the sources. And everything I showed you here, I just deduced from actually looking at those sources without actually referring uh, to, their, to their documentation. Yes, sir? Do we have some insights Do I have any insight about Google's plan to replace the kernel? I don't. I, I don't know that they have that intent. Um, there, there's a lot of speculation going around. I mean, um, if you go back historically, um, um, I think it was Brian Swetland that had mentioned on Linux Weekly News in, one of the, in response to one of the posts that they had actually used Linux. They had looked at BSD, actually. They had seriously looked at BSD, the BSD kernels. But they found that the SOC vendors knew much more how to get deal with Linux than with BSD, and that's what kind of like pushed them in that direction. Um, and so, you know, the question today is still going to be the same thing, which is what are the SOC vendors familiar with? And that for me still remains Linux to a large extent. Um, hey, maybe Google can use their, you know, 800 pound gorilla kind of like weight to push people in some other direction but I've not seen that actually uh, materialize. And I'm not hearing from SOC vendors, you know, Google met us in a secret meeting and they want us to go with, you know, FUBAR. <laughs> uh, might yet happen, but um, still, we're, I think we're, we're good with Linux for, for a short bit. But interestingly, if, with regards to Android, if you look at the um, um, compatibility definition document or whatever they call it these days, or compliance definition document that they used to call it, uh, they don't actually require you to have Linux uh, for running Android, or getting certified as an Android device. Um, they want the Unix capabilities of a Linux-like kernel, but they don't actually require you to use Linux. In fact, they don't even require you to use the EOSP. Um, it just so happens that by using both, you're kind of complying. If that, um, I, I, I know it's not a direct answer to your question, but that's the best I can make. Yes, sir. Sorry? What, what about what, sorry? Oh, Magenta. Um, so that's something that I'm still, um, uh, what about Magenta? So big question mark. I have no idea. I know they, they, <laughs> they, 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 there was an announcement about that, and I was still trying to grasp what the benefit here was and who's pushing. Because, you know, from the outside, Google looks like a big, you know, monolithic box, but inside of it, there's like plenty of teams. So what's the team pushing that, and what are they doing with it? I have no idea uh, at this point. But I'm keeping an eye on it for sure. <laughs> yes, sir. So you uh, told us about the uh, ability to reuse a huge base of users to know about interfaces in uh, Android. Yes. But here we stripped down the whole feature. Granted. There is no uh, standard interface anymore. Correct. Granted. So the, the gentleman makes a very good point, which is my first initial point was, you know, with Android, you, ha you get the benefit of having a tremendous amount of users or developers that know how to code for this. And all of a sudden, hey, we stripped that away. So What's the benefit of this here? Um, uh, the benefit that you get here um, in the way they've at least packaged it for now um, is that you get the same platform enablement that you had before. So if you had been doing platform work in Android before, this is still fairly similar, but at the platform level, not at the application level, right? So if you were using HALs, if you were familiar with using HALs, um, and, and that kind of thing, you're still in the same kind of, you know, framework to a certain extent. But it, you're right. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, another question. So, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they require you to use uh, latest uh, L-test kernel uh, for your device to be supported in Brillo? 
Hmm. Uh, that means your kernel most probably will differ from the one that it has a has some team manufacturer that you use in uh Android because there will be different so to speak. Yeah, so with regards to Brillo, there is this aspect where they're trying to get everybody to run the same kernel for security reasons and, and such things. I am to be honest with you, I haven't investigated that enough to be able to speak of it. Uh, but I know there is, contrary to say, standard Android, where everybody can use whatever kernel they want, they want people to use um, a specific kernel such that you know everybody's uniform across the Brillo devices out there. Um, that's as far as I can go. Um, Oh, okay. That's interesting. Okay, so there, essentially what you're saying is that they, um, the SOC vendor will have to conform to whatever they kernel, the kernel they specify, not the one that they were using. Okay. I mean, but hey, more power to them. They're going to be able to push the SOC vendor to upstream their stuff. I'm not going to complain about that. <laughs> yes, sir. Sorry. Yes, go ahead. Um, okay, so, um, okay, what are the risks associated with using this? Um, so my standpoint with Android has always been that if Google stopped developing it tomorrow morning or if they closed sourced it, um, there's such momentum behind it that I am not afraid that somebody would pick it up and go with it, uh, be it CyanogenMod, be it somebody like, you know, Lux Foundation or what have you. I think there's, you know, Google can try to control it, but I'm not sure that I see exactly how they could do this. Um, with Brillo, it's essentially the same thing to a certain extent insofar as they are able to catch some, if there is going to be some kind of traction behind it, I'm not sure exactly how they're going to be able to control it. The licensing is fairly similar. Um, in fact, you know, in Android's case, the way they control the ecosystem is through a trademark. It's kind of a bit brilliant. They give everything away except, you know, they control how you use the trademark called Android. Um, and so, the, you know, my... My concern is really just an annoyance. I mean, it makes sense from the, their business perspective is this thing about going through their cloud all the time. It's like, hey, you know what? I want to run my own servers. I don't want my data to go through you. But that's a personal opinion. I mean, um, it, it doesn't, you know, it, um, take anything away from, you know, the usefulness of, if they're pushing this for consumer, from a consumer's perspective, um, and so kind of tying, you know, I don't know, my fridge and whatever else to some other services they have, it fits in what they're trying to do. There was a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, I didn't uh, see the PS output, but uh, what are the permissions of the application? Because you said that they open the HDL directly. Yes. So are they running the, under the same like, unique ID like in the Android, or do they have system permissions? Oh, yeah, so what, what are the um, permissions for the applications and such? Um, or the you know the br the br the weave applications. Um, I don't think the permission model that the strict permission model that Android has fits in this. I think really what they're leveraging here is the fact that you've got a common base um, between Brillo and and Android in terms of libraries and such, and also in terms of HALs. Um, uh, beyond that, you know, um, you could run those those apps, the Brillo apps or Weave apps as whatever user that, I mean, I wouldn't bother with that. I would just use whatever user I can, will work for my application. So there is no uh, authentication of like application making sure that, you know, like, yeah, like in Android where you need to have like platform keys and Right, right, right. So the signature mechanism there is not, is, is non-relevant because essentially we're running in C. Um, and so uh, where the, there's, there's no signing of the binaries going on here, right? It's, it's a custom device with a custom set of services, um, and the user is not going to be able to sideload much there, at least not that I can see. Okay. Yes, sir. So um, Radio is another distro. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you really think that, do you think that it could grab the 87% of that new market? <laughs> Yes. Okay. So, um, do I think that Brillo would would cash the eighty? Uh, you know, it, will it be able to accomplish the same thing say Android did on the user platform on the embedded side of things? Um, it, it, to, so, um, when was it? Two, three years ago, at one of the ELCs, I can't remember. I was invited on a panel, and, panel, and we were talking about the different distros. So, somebody was there with, uh, I think, it was Tim were representing uh, Bake Your Own. Um, there was Thomas uh, Petitoni representing, obviously, Buildroot. Uh, there was myself and 
um, there was another uh, gentleman representing, I think, Yachto. I, I can't remember. I, it's a bit vague in my head. But when asked about, you know, uh, some, something similar to that, my response was, I do think Android is going to eat the whole thing um, just because of the SOC enablement. That's the, you know, the thing is SOCs are, SOC vendors are already enabling Android, right? Thereby, they're enabling their chip for a specific usage of it. And if you strip that down to something bare bones and run whatever you want on it, then, hey, you guys have Linux distribution, plus it's all already spec for you. You don't have to select libraries and such things and so on. Um, it remains to be seen. I mean, there's a lot of, um, so Linux historically ate all the build your own operating system things that were there, say, 15 years ago. Um, but the nice thing about Linux is exactly in, in embedded is the organic nature of it, which is I can take it, I can customize it to my needs and not care of the rest. You know, maybe this becomes a base for something. We'll, we'll have to see how, how it goes, uh, how the market reacts to, to this. I mean, for now, they haven't re even released it yet, so it's really hard to grasp what's, what's going to happen. <laughs> yes, sir. One, one, one last big, question. Yes, sir. Yeah, one of the big differences Market and Plastic and Android is the life cycle. Yeah. Plastic and Android, you've got mm -hmm. a short life cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you listen to a lot of other talks that people have been doing here, say for long term support, you want to be close to mainline. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, absolutely. Um, how does this work with this? Because you're talking about SMC enablement and things like that, and typically the things that the SMC vendors put out aren't very close to mainline. Yeah. So aren't we better off with a mainline Linux kernel and not very close? Sure. Um, I mean, so um, are we not better using mainline versus some, something baked by the SOC with, uh, say, uh, in, in terms of Brel? For sure. I mean, if you use something from mainline, it's better. But there are a lot of systems out there that have been put with two four kernels, or even two two kernels. They've never been upgraded, uh, upgraded to anything. Um, you know, my... Um, my worry as we go heavily into this IoT direction is that more and more devices in society are going to be based on things that are never going to be upgraded. But I don't think the issue is with Linux. Um, I think the issue is with the business model surrounding those devices, which is as a manufacturer, you want to put a device out, sell as many as you can, and then move on to the next one. There's almost zero incentive to go back and support this other legacy product that you put out there. Um, so the issue is business models more than, I think, um, specific software support. I think there are certain things you can do on a software side that uh, make it more palatable if you do want to maintain long-term serviceability, uh, such as using LTSI or, or whatever else. Um, but, but ultimately, the, it, it comes down to, are you willing to pay when you put something in the wall for, for it forever? Because that's really what it has to go for, to. Yeah, you know, if I put if I put something in my wall or 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 or, or a medical device or whatever, um, the manufacturer has no incentive to make upgrades unless I'm continuing to pay for those upgrades to a certain extent. And and I think that as consumers, we're not really we're, we don't really want that. <laughs> we want to buy something and never upgrade it. Um, and and the other side, the same thing. The manufacturers are are doing the same. Where from the other side, you have to buy a, a product that gives you. It, uh, yes, I mean, I think it's a business issue more than more than a. More, sorry. The users now don't really care about updating the devices. But if you have two devices that they really have the same price, one that gives you a free update, yeah, and one that gives you no update at all. Well, if you are interested in that, you would it's an interesting. It's a, that something that business model should should go do about. I don't think that users care too much. About I'm with you, uh, but I think the uh, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a more a business discussion than a technical one. Yeah, yeah, for yeah. Sure, for sure. All right, um, I I think we're we're pretty much uh, done in terms of time uh, and, and a bit over. So um, I'm happy to take more questions after the talk if you want to. Um, please uh, come uh, come uh, come up uh, and ask me whatever you want. And I'm going to be here until tomorrow end of day anyway. All right. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.